Ever since humans gained the capacity to wonder, we've contemplated the mysteries and meanings of the night sky. Looking to the sky at night provides glimpses of phenomena that are vastly different than anything we experience on Earth. The aurora remains one of the night sky's most enduring mysteries. These dancing curtains of light have captivated and inspired. They've even frightened and awed. And the aurora behaves in ways that make it seem ghostly or alien, even alive. Only within the last 200 years has our science advanced to a degree where we can begin to understand the physics of the aurora. It's a type of space weather and the most visible effect of the sun's activity on our planet's atmosphere. But there's a lot more to it than that. To help us understand and enjoy the science of the aurora, I'm joined by Saskatchewan's own star man, Ron Waldron of Living Skies Stargazing, a company dedicated to the promotion and enjoyment of the night skies and the universe in which we live. Ron leads guided tours to see the Northern Lights at the Churchill Northern Study Center in Churchill, Manitoba, as well as on cruise ships in Norway. Ron, thanks so much uh, for joining me this evening. I'm looking forward to learning about the Aurora from you. Good evening, Mike. It's a pleasure to be invited here and uh, hello to anyone watching. And I have a lot of questions for Ron uh, coming up here in, in just a moment. Uh, at the end of the broadcast, or maybe during the broadcast, we'll try to incorporate some audience questions as well. So if you have questions for Ron about the Aurora, please drop those into the chat on um, the live events page on explore.org. And we have a very helpful moderator who's looking for those questions and that she will be able to feed those to me. And we'll see if we can get to a few of those later on in the broadcast. And this broadcast is live. Uh, so we hope to see the Aurora on camera right now at the, uh, on the Northern Lights Cam at the Churchill Northern Study Center. It's a bit cloudy in Churchill right now. So we'll see what happens. Uh, you never know. That's uh, you know, the, the gamble that you make when you're, when you're looking for um, weather events. Um, but we'll, we'll see what happens. In the meantime, we have a lot of photos, videos, um, and a lot of great science uh, to share with you. And Ron, there's, the story of the Aurora is a, a story really of the, the sun interacting with invisible forces generated by our planet. So I think maybe we could start with the sun itself. Um, and can you explain how the aurora is related to our sun? Well, it, all the activity in terms of aurora that we see begin inside the sun, uh, right at the core of the sun actually, where the temperature is estimated to be around 27 million degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius, take your pick. And at the core of the sun is where the uh, hydrogen burns into helium and nuclear fusion takes place. That generates an awful lot of heat. And that heat begins to radiate out through the sun. And then it forms convection currents near the surface of the sun. As that heat is being generated, often uh, the currents that are created inside will create uh, coronal holes and sunspots on the surface of the sun. And these coronal holes and the sunspots start some, a process called the solar wind streaming out into space. And as the solar wind interacts with the uh, Earth's magnetic field, uh, that's what creates the aurora. And we'll go into a little more detail about that shortly, but basically it's all activity starting within the sun that creates the aurora on the Earth. Without the sun, there would be no aurora. So when we, when we have that solar wind interacting with the Earth's magnetic field, what happens there? How does that create really the light that our eyes can see? So the magnetic field is like the magnetic field around a bar magnet. So if you imagine the uh, axis of the Earth to be similar to a bar magnet, anyone who's done the experiment at school with the iron filings on a piece of paper and a bar magnet underneath will know the shape that it forms. And so when the solar wind hits that magnetic field, and thank heavens we've got it, uh, because that is our shield, that is our protection. That's the reason there's still life on Earth. But when it hits the Earth, it compresses it on the daylight side and stretches it out on the night side. And as it stretches out on the night side, sometimes it stretches so far that it actually snaps and it sends the particles streaming back to the weakest areas of the uh, magnetic field, which is at the North and South Pole. And so those, uh, 
those particles begin streaming down into the poles and that uh, shows up as northern lights. And the aurora manifests itself um, in a lot of different forms. Um, one of the shapes it actually takes sort of on a global scale is that it's, it, it's a ring really around the poles. Uh, so if you're standing at the North Pole, for example, then you need to actually look south to see it. I've always been curious though, why does it form a ring in that manner around like uh, the poles of the earth? Yeah, that's that's the boundary, the literally the threshold between the photons from the sun and where it strikes the atmosphere. That's where the interaction is beginning and it doesn't wait till okay. it gets to the center. It actually starts further out. And so you get that ring and the ring is uh, a complete circle, but usually from space you only see it as an arc because on the daylight side you just don't see it that well. And you know the the aurora in the in the atmosphere uh, manifests in a lot of different forms. Uh, one of the ways that it manifests itself is it, it actually it moves. It, it shimmers. It has waves. So can you take us through um, some of the physics that would cause it to actually move and, and quiver like it does when you when you see it on the northern lights cam? And I've been lucky enough to see the aurora maybe just once or twice in my life, but it it does it does move. Yes, yes, it does. And it's it's got everything to do with the energy of the particles that creates the movement. So if you have weak, slowly moving particles, let's say under 300 kilometers per second that are hitting the Earth, the, the northern lights appears fairly static. But once you get past, let's say, 400 kilometers per second, you're going to see some movement in the uh, in the upper atmosphere. And the more excited the particles are, the more it moves. And the more it moves, the more chance you are you have of seeing color. And the colors are, are simply amazing. Uh, most people tend to see, well, for myself, I tend to see gray until it really starts to move. But some people really, truly see the green and see it very, very clearly. I tend to catch that only with my camera. And that was actually my next question. Uh, what about those colors? Uh, you know, most of the time it, it seems to be green, uh, but there can be like pinks or reds in there, maybe a little bit of purple, uh, depending on the strength of the aurora from what I've read. Uh, so can you uh, explain to us just how those different colors uh, come about? Yeah, the, uh, it, it depends on what the uh, solar wind and the photons are interacting with. So if they're interacting with oxygen, high up in the atmosphere that's your red that's that's the red aurora okay. and it's reasonably rare to to see red you can photograph red but to actually see it with your eye it's it's reasonably rare uh, then the green which is the most common color to see is about 250 kilometers up which is the standard height of most aurora about 250 kilometers and then if it really is active and penetrates deeply into the atmosphere, you can get the blue and the purple forming. Uh, and again, that's fairly rare and usually only photographic. And sometimes in that mix of red, green, blue, and purple, you'll get yellow. And I notice the yellow quite a bit, even with my eyes, especially when the aurora is near the horizon, uh, where the atmosphere tends to be thicker. That's where the yellow seems to really come through. How oh, fascinating. I've no, not actually seen a yellow aurora myself. So uh, that's something else that I'll be looking for the next time I go out uh, stargazing for that. Of course, um, you know, the aurora is a type of space weather, but it, uh, for us to be able to see it, it's also weather dependent. Um, so what conditions uh, or weather offer the best opportunity for us to see the aurora? Yeah, there's four, four requirements to see the aurora. Well, five if you count good vision. <laughs> but uh, the, f the four conditions are, of course, a clear sky. Now, you can see aurora through a cloudy sky, and it, it can be quite photographic, but completely overcast, you're not going to see anything except maybe a tinge of green. But uh, for photographers in a broken cloud sky, the aurora can be quite dramatic. But in terms of what you need, you got to have a clear sky or clear breaks in the sky, you need to have activity on the sun. 
So there has to be an event on the sun, either a, a coronal hole, a, a large sunspot, some sort of event on the sun to produce the aurora. Um, and then you, it's really helpful if you have no moon in the sky. Uh, you can see aurora under a full moon, but it never looks quite as dramatic as in a clear inky black sky. And the, the fourth and final requirement, and it's not really a requirement, it's just kind of on your wish list. The aurora tends to be most common near and around the equinoxes. So the spring equinox and the fall equinox, there's something about the angle of the geomagnetic uh, field, or the magnetic field of the Earth, to the uh, stream of particles coming from the sun that makes the equinoxes the best time to see them. Not the only time, oh, but they tend to peak. And that actually, uh, you, when you were considering, uh, you're talking about weather, um, you know, we had a, a question come in um, that's kind of related to my next one. Uh, somebody was wondering if, you know, since the moon has a weak magnetic field, might the aurora be seen by future moon dwellers? And I was actually kind of wondering, you know, do other planets have aurora? And, and if so, what does that mean for their internal workings? Would they then therefore have magnetic fields, these other planets, if they have aurora? Well, I think it's correct that the moon's magnetic field is extremely weak. You're not going to see aurora on the moon, I doubt. However, if you've got a good pair of binoculars and you're on the moon, you could probably see the ring around the top of the Earth. That that would be a possibility. Uh, in terms of the other planets, the, there's two groups of planets uh, in our eight-planet system. There's the rocky planets, the first four, and then there's the gas giants, the last four. And it turns out that the Earth plus the four gas giants have the magnetic fields, the strong magnetic fields. And that's why those planets, Earth and the four gas giants, all experience aurora. And we have photos of Jupiter and Saturn and even of Uranus and Neptune with various forms of auroras uh, showing up at their poles. That said, those are the five that have the magnetic field. Uh, Mars and Venus and Mercury have extremely weak magnetic fields and you're not going to see aurora on any of those. And, you know, beyond the, the tangible, or excuse me, the, the, the aurora's ability to inspire wonder, uh, the Northern Lights, the aurora, uh, they can have a, a tangible impact on our civilization. How can solar activity and the aurora affect our electrical and communication systems? Oh, it can be deadly. Um, the solar wind and the solar activity goes in cycles. And uh, we just, uh, we're just coming out of a dip in the solar cycle, headed towards a peak in 2025. So every five and a half years, we're either at a peak or a dip. We're just coming out of the dip. So the aurora is going to keep getting better as we go. In terms of act on civilization, um, the astronauts have to prepare for solar events. They have a place aboard the International Space Station where they, they literally hunker, hunker down and ride out the storm. And I, I don't have at the top of my head how many times they've had to use that, but because we've been at a solar minimum in the last three, four years, probably not very often, if at all. Uh, in 19, I think it was 89, March of 89, the entire province of Quebec experienced a power failure due to a storm on the sun. And there was, a, there was blackout conditions across the entire province. So, and then the satellites that are orbiting around the earth, the thousands of satellites, they're all vulnerable to activity on the sun. And in the past, so, uh, solar activity has knocked out some satellites. Uh, and so anytime there's a major storm on the sun, the people that monitor the satellites are always watching and kind of crossing their fingers that no damage is done. 
And how were scientists able to predict like these geomagnetic magnetic storms, um, you know, th that that cause the aurora? And how far ahead can we forecast them? Well, it's it's either as good as the weather forecast, or maybe maybe a little bit better. I'm not sure, but <laughs> we we have some satellites out there. Uh, NASA has some, and so does the European Space Agency. Uh, NASA and the European Space Agency went together on a SOHO satellite, which is placed in a parking orbit, uh, watching the sun all the time, constantly monitoring the sun. And we've been able to use that SOHO satellite to predict activity, well, to see the activity on the sun and predict its Im impact. There's also a set of stereo satellites that NASA set up, and uh, they follow the Earth in its orbit around the sun. One is at the, one is behind the Earth as it moves, and the other is ahead of the Earth. And they're able to watch the, uh, as the material leaves the sun, they're able to monitor its approach to the Earth and help us with predictions. So to put a number on it, I would say that, and this is going to sound a lot like the weather, we, we can give a one-month forecast on, on uh, wow. auroral activity. But the best forecast is going to be the three-day one, and it'll probably be the most accurate. And that's actually... Uh kind of related to a couple of audience questions that we um, that we had. Uh, one person was asking, you know, the Aurora was pretty active over uh, Norway and Iceland earlier, um, but the forecast wasn't very favorable for Churchill. So, you know, what causes it to change in just a few hours where you might have, you know, it being very active over uh, parts of Northern Europe, but once, uh, you know, it gets dark over North America, it's not so great here. Well, it's timing, really. I mean, it's it's the timing of when the particles hit that uh, auroral arc area and when the storm actually strikes the Earth. So it happens to sometimes uh, Norway is going to be luckier than Churchill, and sometimes it'll be the opposite. Um, I have seen uh, aurora in both places, and they're equally remarkable. The only thing I will mention with relation to Churchill versus Norway. When I'm in Norway, I'm on a cr cruise ship and we're, we're moving in and out of weather systems as we move up the coast of Norway. That's not as ideal a situation to watch the aurora as it is in Churchill, because in Churchill, you're parked in one spot, you have a stable place to put up your camera, and you can get beautiful photographs. But in terms of, uh, you know, it being really good in Norway, and maybe not so good in Churchill, it probably spent itself in Norway. And then, you know, we kind of got the tail end of it, but it, it can happen in reverse too. And someone else was wondering why does the, the space weather data, uh, you know, not correspond, correspond with what we see overhead. You know, um, sometimes uh, <laughs> it looks like uh, the space weather says, Hey, things are coming, things are looking good. And then conversely you have like uh, nothing going on, but then all of a sudden there's quiet data and then lots of activity overhead. So for, for people who are really out there trying to predict you know, what, what they, they can see, maybe you can give them um, some insight into why uh, things may look good but not be able to see anything overhead. Yeah, we, any of us who are Aurora watchers, we, we all experience the highs and the lows of the forecast. And nine times out of 10 when they miss it, when they don't get it right, it's because the stream of uh, solar wind that headed towards the Earth, instead of impacting directly with the Earth, it, it did what we call a glancing blow. And a glancing blow is never as good as a direct hit. And nine times out of 10, that's what it is. I don't hear many stories of, well, they just got the science wrong. You know, the, the particles weren't as energetic as they thought, or it's usually, the angle at which it hits the earth, the glancing blow versus the direct hit. But we've all experienced it. And, uh, you know, um, you usually get some kind of aurora, but you don't get what they predicted. And I do have a, a couple of questions um, for you, Ron, and your personal experiences watching the aurora. I want to save those to the, uh, for the very end of our broadcast. Uh, we have, um, I think, a couple of questions that you probably get fairly frequently, you know, during your tours 
um, and when you're doing your your talks, um, one person was was wondering, does the aurora make a sound? I've seen a lot of controversy on this. Um, some people say absolutely, you can hear the aurora. Other people say no, there is no no possible way that you can hear it. But what's your take on that? Can can does the aurora yeah, make a sound? What a, what a great question, and I've been asked it a thousand times. And <laughs> this uh, aurora has never been successfully recorded, so. That's the first, that's the premise okay. that I'll start with. I have been watching Aurora since I was 12 years old. I'm a lot older than that now. I've never heard the Aurora. And I've been in the places where if you're going to hear it, you should be able to hear it. That said, I'm hard of hearing. <laughs> so take that for what it's worth. My wife has heard the Aurora. I know better than to argue with my wife. Now to honestly answer the question, uh, it's never been recorded. It's too high up for the sound to reach the earth, so it should not be possible. However, the reports continue to stream in from people who have heard the aurora, people who live in the conditions and experience aurora every single night. And they describe it as a crackling sound. Uh, sometimes it's described as a hum. Uh, but it seems to be some sort of electrical generation. It could be that their physical makeup is more attuned to the energy being produced by Aurora. The, the science is still, the jury's still out on that. And uh, I've never heard it. I don't expect to ever hear it. Um, but my, my own wife has heard it. So what a great question. That's one of those. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of those mysteries. I think that people will be um, debating and contemplating for a, for a long, long time. Um, oh, somebody was wondering. Um, I, I'm in Maine right now. I'm in northern Maine. Somebody was actually wondering if I can see the aurora where I live in Maine, and you definitely can uh, see the aurora here when the conditions are, are right. Uh, but uh, for you, Ron, what's the what's the farthest south in the U.S. that um, the the northern lights have been seen? And do you have to be? Somebody else was wondering. Do you have to be in a cold climate to see the aurora? Yeah, no, aurora is not affected by cold. Uh, but it just just so happens the latitude dictates it's going to be cold. So you can see uh, on rare occasions you can see aurora as far south as Texas, but that's rare very rare. And it really depends on what's called the KP number uh, for the aurora, which is a measure of the strength of the auroral stream of the solar wind. And uh, if you've got anything above a KP five or six, it only, it only goes, well, I've only seen a seven, so it doesn't go much higher than that. But um, if, if you've got a very high KP number, that's an estimate of how far south you can see it. So, for example, in Maine, you should be able to see a KP5. Um, and then a little further south, if it's a 6 or a 7. But it's, you know, from those southern latitudes, it's going to be low on the horizon in the north. And you're going to have to get out of the city to see it. But if you do all those things and maybe add a camera to the mix, which is more sensitive than the eye is to the aurora, then you're probably going to get a photo of it. And I think we have time for maybe just one more audience question before I get to the, my final two questions for you, uh, Ron. Uh, somebody was wondering, how, how did First Nations peoples experience and interpret the aurora? Um, I know that it could be a difficult question to answer because there's such a diversity of First Nations cultures. Um, but maybe yeah. you can share a little bit of uh, information on that. Well. All cultures shared the same sky. All cultures saw the same constellations. All cultures, well, not all saw the aurora, but all cultures in the northern areas saw the aurora. And they all told stories, both about the constellations and about the aurora. And the stories vary. They were interpreted as a an object of fear because it wasn't well understood. And when you don't understand something very well, um, you, you tend to fear it. There were some wild um, theories that it was a fox running across the snow and the fox, uh, the tail of the fox was rubbing against the snow and that caused the aurora. And when I was growing up, I was told by my own parents that it was the, uh, 
the reflection of the sun off the icebergs, which of course indicated that it wasn't really well understood at that time. But the First Nations people um, used it sometimes as a babysitter. Uh, if you went outside, if the kids went outside during the Aurora storm, uh, it would pick you up and drag you away. And that kind of kept the kids inside the house. A great babysitter. <laughs> but but everybody had a different take on the Aurora. And if, uh, you know, just a couple of questions for you uh, before we conclude the broadcast here. If, if, if it's even possible to describe, you know, what, it, what is it like to witness uh, the Aurora overhead? Oh, <laughs> it's uh, one of the seven wonders of the world. So it's a bucket list item for sure. And uh, people who see the Aurora in all its glory, and that's the people that I tend to work with, the people who actually travel to the places you can see it the best. I mean, I never tire of showing them the Aurora because they just, uh, they lap it up. It's, it's an amazing thing to watch. It's different every time you see it. The colors can be incredible. And it just moves like a phantom in the night. Um, there is no sp natural spectacle that I'm aware of that is as awe-inspiring. I mean, you can be awestruck by a volcano and the lava, but I mean, that's kind of terrifying. The aurora doesn't need to be terrifying. It's just a wonder to watch its movements and its grace and the forms that it can take. Um, like I said, it's one of the seven natural wonders. So it's it's right up there on everybody's bucket list. And my last question for you is, do you have a favorite Aurora viewing moment that you'd like to share with us? I have many, but I did choose one because, because I knew you were going to ask the question. It was in 2019. I was at the Churchill Northern Studies Center in, uh, in Churchill and it was March the 16th. And I don't have the camera equipment that some people have, but so I was taking still shots and then splicing them together. But it was a full moon that night, or very close to a full moon. I wasn't expecting much of an aurora. But we were out there watching the group of us, and it started as a, a kind of an umbilical cord that snaked its way across the sky. And then all of a sudden, it picked a spot in the sky, and it just mushroomed out in a huge cloud with greens and pinks. And then it moved its way around us like it was circling us, and then it spent itself above the Churchill Northern Studies Center building. And the amazing thing was, it all lasted for five incredible minutes. I mean, I'm used to watching the Aurora for two to three hours. But, but that night, it was average. And then there was that five minute of pure photon bliss, I'll call it. And it was competing with the full moon, but the full moon never stood a chance. I mean, it outshone the full moon. And when we got back inside, the people that I was wor working with said, what did we just see? And I said, I don't know. I've never seen that before. Because <laughs> I'd seen Aurora for three years uh, doing these tours, but I'd never seen a display like that. And it's just locked in my memory. And I still remember posting it on my Living Skies Facebook page. It went viral. Well, I, it depends what you call viral. But I mean, put it this way, 25,000 hits for me is not not a usual hit. Uh, and uh, people just seem to, and I, I don't take as good of photographs as some people are able to, but I did capture that in a way that helped me remember it. It was amazing. That sounds incredible. Uh, so yeah, I that sounds really, really amazing. I don't think I have much else to, to share uh, uh, about well, that. I, um, I, Mike, I began my post with, if I live to be 90, I don't know that I'll ever see this again. And I really mean that. I'll keep doing these tours. I don't know if I'll ever get another five minutes like that. I just don't know. Well, I'll keep my fingers crossed that you do get another opportunity to share that with, um, with your group and with everyone else uh, around the world. Um, Ron, this has been a really fun conversation. I've learned a lot 
about uh, the aurora borealis um, and the the northern lights. Uh, you know, not long ago in human history, the night sky and the northern lights were really a completely mysterious realm. You know, we could see it, but we really lack the tools and the cumulative knowledge to remove the veil that shrouded its secrets. And now we know more about the aurora. And for me, uh, I, th I think that really enhances my, my wonder of it. Because we understand the purpose of a flower, for example, doesn't, doesn't make it any less, <clears throat> excuse me, beautiful. And the aurora, of course, doesn't have a purpose. It, it just is. However, no matter the level of scientific mystery surrounding it, watching the aurora will remain an enthralling and ethereal experience. And my guest uh, this evening has been Ron Waldron of Living Skies Stargazing in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Ron, thanks so much for joining me today. You're very welcome. Take care.